There are thousands of years of human history, but we spend less than two decades of our lives in education. That isn't enough time to condense down everything you need to know into history classes, especially when there are other subjects to be taught when we're at school. Sadly, that means that some really interesting information gets left out. We're going to fix that in this video. Here are some of the historical facts your teachers never got around to telling you. If you found yourself struck down by the bubonic plague during the 1600s, you'd have found yourself calling on the services of the Plague Doctor. With their dark robes and grotesque masks, they look like something out of a horror movie. But they were there to try to save your life, often with little success. Successful doctors didn't want to lay their own hands on victims of the plague because they were afraid of being infected. So the men behind the masks were often young medical students or people with no medical training at all. History records at least one case of a fruit and vegetable salesman who doubled up as a plague doctor. Their masks were stuffed with fruit and spices because they believed the pleasant aromas would prevent them from catching plague from their patients. They were wrong, but it didn't stop them going about their trade for around 200 years until the practice died out during the 1800s. If you think that high-heeled shoes are the exclusive preserve of female fashion, you should think again. The first ever high-heeled shoes were actually intended for men, and they wore them with pride for many years. It's thought that the first ever high heels were worn by Greek actors taking to the stage from around 200 BC, when the heels were known as kothomi, which were about four inches high. As an item of fashion wear, they made their debut in Europe during the Middle Ages, when both men and women would wear a type of high heel called a patten. This time, they had a practical use. The streets of the Middle Ages were filthy, and so high heels were a way of making sure long flowing garments didn't scrape along the road and pick up dirt. Over time, they became associated with status. The higher the heel, the more important the wearer. Some high heels of this era were 20 inches tall, making it almost impossible to walk. But hey, at least the person wearing them looked important. Many of us can't imagine starting our day without a tea or a coffee. But what did people drink before tea and coffee became commonplace? You might think it was water, but that was a risky business during the Middle Ages. The water of the time was unsanitary, and so drinking it often led to illness. Fruit juice was available, but most people chose alcohol over fruit juice. There was no shortage of milk, but milk was viewed as something to feed the young and the elderly, and was generally only consumed by those in between if they were ill. The rich and noble of people of the Middle Ages had exceptionally well-kept collections of wine, whereas the poor would often brew their own ale, cider, and mead. The ancient Romans used to make beer with barley, but many other types of grain were introduced over time. Perhaps this is why there were so many wars in the past. Everybody was drunk all the time. On the topic of food and drink, nowadays we accept that the best way to eat is sitting up straight, or even standing up. It helps the food progress down your throat to the stomach and aids with the digestion process. The ancient Greeks and Romans hadn't quite got that figured out yet. They used to do their eating laying down, as you can see from various forms of artwork which depict Romans and Greeks at mealtimes. The Greeks started the tradition of laying down to eat around 2,700 years ago, and the Romans picked up the habit from them. It's thought that eating while reclining was a sign of wealth and power. It was the standard pose for the wealthy to adopt while they were waiting for servants to bring them their meals. People often ate in large groups with what we'd now call large couches pushed together so they could socialize without getting up. Some of the couches used by men even had extra space so female companions could join them. How thoughtful! If you were going into hospital for major surgery today, you'd be placed under a local or general anesthetic. Anesthetic using gas or injections is a relatively modern invention, though. So how did ancient surgeons go about their work without anesthetic? The pain of surgery was a major problem for those surgeons of old. Everybody from the Babylonians to the Sumerians tried to find a solution to it. The most common proven early form of anesthetic was alcohol, which was only partially effective at best. Some scientists think, but cannot prove, 
that the Sumerians may have used opium poppies as anesthetic 5,000 years ago. The Assyrians were definitely using opium by 2,700 years ago. In India and China before opium was known, cannabis incense was used to help numb patients before they went under the knife, accompanied by a large dose of wine. The English weren't so lucky. Until around 1500, the closest thing to anesthetic was a potion known as dwale, made up of hemlock, bile, bryony, and lettuce. The storming of the Bastille is something you might have heard about in history class. When it happened 230 years ago, it was considered to be a pivotal moment, which sparked what would eventually become the French Revolution and the overthrowing of the French monarchy. It's therefore natural to assume that it was a major success, but in reality it would have to be viewed as a failure. Although the protesters successfully entered and liberated the Bastille, they hadn't stopped to check how many prisoners were in there at the time. Therefore, one of the most famous instances of a prison being stormed in human history resulted in the freedom of just seven people, four of whom were humble forgers rather than political prisoners. It had fallen out of use as a high-security prison and was defended by soldiers who had been deemed medically unfit for other forms of work. To put it another way, protesters stormed a castle patrolled by injured old men and freed a few fraudsters. It doesn't sound quite so impressive now. It's impossible to think of Paris and France without thinking of the world-famous Eiffel Tower which has stood there for over a century. The French are quite rightly very proud of it, which is something of a turnaround from 1909, when they wanted to have it dismantled. The 984-foot-tall tower was built for the 1889 World Fair and had a license to occupy the land it stood upon for 20 years. By the time those 20 years expired, many Parisians considered it to be an ugly inconvenience. Gustave Eiffel, the tower's designer, was still alive by this time, and so came up with a plan to save it. Using its unprecedented height, he turned it into a working laboratory for radio and flight testing, as well as an observatory. That kept it going until the First World War, during which it used its lofty position to intercept German radio communications. One of the messages it intercepted was from German military commander Georg von der Marwitz, confirming a delay in a planned attack. The delay allowed the French army to swarm the battlefield, which arguably prevented the fall of Paris. The tower would go on to transmit the first television signals in French history. Women in the United States of America didn't even have the right to vote in national elections until 1920, so we might assume that they had little role in American politics before that time. Even today, we're yet to see a female president, that makes the tale of the first female elected official in American history a surprising one. Her name was Susanna Medora Salter, and she became mayor of Argonia, Kansas in 1887, when she was only 27 years old. Her name was added to a ballot as a joke by a group of men who wanted to ridicule the idea of women serving in office. The joke backfired. The local women's Christian temperance movement voted for her, backed by Republicans. Salter didn't even know she was up for election, but accepted the position when she won. Her time in office was mostly uneventful, and opted not to seek re-election at the end of her one-year term. Have you ever looked at a full suit of armor in a museum and wondered how a knight would go to the toilet using one? So have we! The answer to the question is a little messy. The style of armored suit, which was commonly worn in battle during the 1400s, didn't have a specific plate covering the groin because that would have made riding a horse impossible. They did, however, have fairly rigid metal skirts, which came down from the hips, below which was a long chainmail shirt, and a belt which kept leg plates from slipping out of place. Once a knight was wearing a full suit, it would be impossible to go to the toilet without removing the rear cullet of the suit. In practice, this usually involved asking a squire to take it off, or raise it, so they could answer the call of nature. Unfortunately, when in a battle situation, this was often impractical. That left them with one option, and it's an unpleasant one. More often than not, a knight in shining armor would simply go to the toilet inside his suit. 
Nobody is saying childhood is easy for anybody these days. But at least children growing up in the 21st century aren't treated the way the Spartans treated their young. In the ancient Greek city-state of Sparta, a newborn baby was the property of the state, not of its parents. When a baby was born, soldiers would call at the house of the parents and bathe the baby in wine to assess how it reacted. If the baby cried too much or reacted badly, they deemed it to be weak, and so either took it away to become a slave or abandoned it to die on a hillside. If it was deemed to be strong, it would be left with its family until the age of seven. Girls were then sent off to school, and boys were taken to a special military school where they were deliberately starved, beaten, and trained to fight. If they survived to age 20, they would face one final physical and mental test which would determine their fate. Those who passed would become aristocrats, and those who failed became middle class. The perks of becoming an aristocrat included being given a wife and a farm tended by slaves. They couldn't live with their wife at the farm, though. They had to remain in military barracks until the age of 30. According to the Catholic faith, the Pope is the chosen representative of God on Earth. That means popes are usually older men who have devoted their lives to the Church and have the benefit of experience. There are exceptions to the rule, though, and none more so than Pope Benedict IX, who was only 20 years old when he assumed papacy in 1032. His history-making doesn't stop there. He's also the only pope to have held the role more than once, and also the only person to have sold his position for financial gain. Benedict's ascension to the role was illegitimate. The previous pope, John XIX, was his uncle, and bribed officials to confirm Benedict as his successor. There was a rebellion, and he was briefly driven out of Rome by Pope Sylvester III. But Benedict and his supporters rallied and took back his position some months later. He sold the position to his godfather, who became Pope Gregory VI, but changed his name and forcibly evicted Gregory to become Pope for a third time before Henry, King of the Germans, stepped in to evict Benedict's entire troublesome family. Pope Clement II took over, and order was restored. When it comes to living a life of wealth and splendor, it doesn't come much bigger than being the Queen of England. Elizabeth II has sat on the throne since 1953, and during that time, she hasn't had to want for a thing, and nor has she had to do anything which the majority of us would consider work. That doesn't mean the Queen has never worked a day in her life, though. During the Second World War, every British citizen was expected to do their duty, even if they were the heir to the throne. The young Elizabeth wanted to join the war effort, even though her father, King George VI, was against her doing so. She found work as an engineer, specializing as a truck mechanic in the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service. At the time, she was only 16 years old. It would seem that she was a natural at the job. She could completely deconstruct and reassemble truck engines without assistance, and was promoted to the rank of junior commander after less than six months with the service. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!